and you can see that um, we stand here naked before you. There is no screen. We're not going to have any slides, which is very hard because I always use slides. But we thought we would talk about the big issues today and then open it up to questions because that's always the most fun thing to do. And obviously, everybody has different perspectives on what's been going on. So I'm going to start by saying that you all know that the Fed did not raise interest rates the other day. Uh, the market sold off today. And it's kind of ironic because you probably recall that a few months ago, when they were scared the Fed would raise rates, the market sold off. So it's a great reminder that investing in stocks in particular is really for people who have a long-term horizon because there's always going to be a lot of stuff in the short term that affects the markets day to day. So to get to the long term, I want to put two thoughts out there before we do talk about interest rates in China and everything else. And those two thoughts are that when you think about what's going to happen in the next decades to come, the biggest trends are really technology and demographics. And you all know that, right? You all know how much technology has changed the way you interact with your cell phone, with your iPad. It's also changed the way companies are operating. Every industry is being disrupted. It's created an enormous change in the way companies think about their businesses. And they know the speed at which change is happening is faster than it's ever been before. You also know about demographics, right? The whole world is getting older. And many of the patterns that we've seen in the economy based on younger populations are not with us the same way. So there's going to be a lot of different trends because of these changing demographics. Lots of transitions are going to result from both of these. And when you think about it, it's almost surprising the economy has been as good as it has, given that these transitions are already starting. At the same time, we're trying to recover from the horrors of the credit crisis with a lot of intervention by governments around the globe, some good, some not so good. So there's been lots and lots of change. And when you, tr when you translate this into markets, I would argue that companies have actually been doing a pretty good job. Companies learned a lot in 08. They learned they couldn't depend on short-term financing. They had to worry about the liquidity drying up. And what they've done is they've improved the quality of their balance sheets, and they're being pretty careful in how they invest. So that leads to my first big point, which is that we, uh, I would argue, do not think that stocks are dangerous at this point, despite some of the, the noise you've heard recently. Um, the recent pullback we had, um, which was indeed spurred by some concerns about China, um, was pretty modest. You know, we had 10% pullbacks in the market are normal. We hadn't had one in quite a long time. It was only about a 12% sell-off that we had recently. And that's absolutely to be expected. I want you to expect more volatility in the markets than we've had recently. In the last blip, there's more evidence of that. The reason I would argue stocks are attractive for long-term investors is that price earnings ratios are a little higher than average but they are not very high relative to what interest rates are. Interest rates are extraordinarily low, and even though they will go up over time, they're still very, very low by any historical standard. In addition, companies are sitting on piles of cash. You see articles about that all the time. And that has given them confidence to raise their dividends quite repeatedly, often in excess of earnings growth, and therefore the dividend yield you're getting on stocks today is quite good relative to what we've seen in prior decades. So, you know, from our perspective, you know, stocks are, are attractive, but I also want to caution that we don't think returns will be as good as they have been in prior decades. Those of you who were lucky enough to invest in the 80s and the 90s saw very strong equity returns. In the 80s, it was because interest rates were coming down. In the 90s, it was because of the internet bubble. Those things are not going to be with us going forward. I think that you're going to see stocks propelled by earnings growth and dividend growth. And both, and earnings growth is fairly modest, dividend growth is okay, but I would expect returns on stocks more in the 6 to 7% range than the 10 to 11 you saw historically, ups and downs along the way. And I would still argue that you need bonds, despite the fact that eventually rates go up and bond returns would be quite modest, because despite the unappealing interest rates we're seeing today, Bonds have proven themselves decade after decade to be the cheapest and best defense against the volatility of stocks, and that's the main reason to own them. So that's a big picture on the big asset classes. I thought sometimes people say, is there something else? And there are, of course. But the, if you look at the two barbells, stocks for growth and bonds for safety, they still do their jobs. I mentioned volatility, and um, I want to go back to that because when you think of the markets, markets have actually been historically calm 
in the past three or four years, much less volatile than normal. And the, little, the recent blip we had, as I said, was actually quite modest. The reasons for it, though, show you how jittery investors still are. Um, one of the reasons I feel good about stocks is there is no irrational exuberance out there, right? When's the last time people told you how excited they were about buying stock? It's sort of like people are holding their nose and going in. So when there was any sign that China was slowing down, which we all know it is, there was a, a sense of panic that, that made people sell pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to say briefly on China, and this, I don't know where, we haven't, we haven't compared notes, so I don't know where we're going to come out on this, but um, we have guys on the ground in Hong Kong and China, and their view is that, um, of course, the economy is slowing down. We all know it has to. We can't grow with that kind of rate forever. But the, um, the industrial, the infrastructure, the heavy industry part of the economy is indeed slowing down very sharply. But the consumer side is still growing quite well. We're seeing about 3% growth on the industrial side, about 10% growth on the consumer side, which gives you an average of something of like a 6% range for a while. So we don't think China's slowing down to the 2% range. We think it's going to be more in the you know, six, 5 6 percent range for a while, which is still much better than any other developed economy and certainly much better than some smaller economies as well. So even though China is, um, is, 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 a, is a big unknown, and we know we can't trust the numbers, we can't trust lots coming out of China, they evidence their immaturity in some ways by some of the actions they took that you read about when they tried to manipulate the stock market, they devalued their currency without thinking through the ramifications. They're going through a, ma a major transition from a very, very backward country to an incredibly developed country over time. And, but there's going to be lots of ups and downs along the way, and we have to accept that's going to be part of the volatility that global markets will experience as they go up and down. So um, the last thing I want to mention on volatility is you might have read about um, volatility in ETFs. I don't know if you're ready about that, but there's lots of new, there's new structures in the market all the time. And until you get an evidence of something that's a little amiss, you don't know it exists. But let me just say that there are new, there are investment structures that developed since 08 because people want to reduce risk that actually will exacerbate the sell-offs when they happen because they have sort of automatic triggers that make that happen. So um, my big message is, you know, stocks are, I think are okay as long as you don't expect huge and robust returns. I would still argue you need bonds for stability, but do expect more volatility going forward. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Hugh to take um, his counterpoints and then we'll open it up to your questions about um, all of these issues and of course the one we can touch upon as well. Uh, I, nice to be here, nice, nice of you each to come here. I, uh, uh, I've been speaking to you for I think each of the last, oh I don't know, three or four years. And, and each, time, each time I speak to you I I share with you some of the interesting signs I see out in this world of ours. Many of them you find on churches, and I thought I would start out by first of all reminding you of the, what I talked about the last time I got together with you, and I saw a sign on a church, in front of the church, which said, tired of sin, come on in. And, and somebody that etched underneath that sign, uh, if not all well, 70 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, this year, in, in traveling around, I, I, uh, I, I saw a sign which said, uh, morning sermon, uh, Jesus walks on water. Evening sermon, uh, searching for Jesus. <laughs> Um, I decided to go into the church and I, I, I sat in the, in the last uh, pew row and there was a very nice elderly lady who was sitting next to me and she was, she was praying and I thought I'd share with you what she said. She said, uh, dear, dear Lord, uh, the last year and a half has been very tough. You have taken my favorite actor, James Garner, uh, my favorite actress, uh, Loren McCall, my favorite comedian, Robin Williams, and finally my favorite author, Tom Clancy. 
I just wanted you to know that my favorite politicians are Barack Obama, Joe <laughs> Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Harry Reid. <laughs> um, so much for the humor, now let's get to the financial <laughs> Um, there's uh, the, the most important, the most, as I see it, the most important question um, that, that we all face as uh, investors, and for that matter, even as business people, is uh, have we reached the end of the current stock market business uh, interest rate cycle? Another way of asking the same question is, is the 13% uh, or so uh, decline that we saw in stock prices in late August um, is that, uh, was that a, simply a correction in an ongoing bull market, or was that uh, the beginning of a bear market, uh, the end of a bull market, the beginning of a bear market, which would be accompanied by a recession? Uh, I have a fairly uh, interesting methodology, a methodology of trying to answer uh, all of the, not only that question, but to, to manage portfolios, the structure of portfolios effectively. And, uh, the, uh, the, the methodology, first step in the methodology, for those of you who have not heard this before, is to get up in the morning and to look in the mirror and to, to confess that you don't have a clue where the markets or the economy is going. Uh, the, the second, third, uh, fourth steps are a little bit more intriguing. The, the second step is to identify the important trends that are unfolding in the financial markets. The third step uh, is to uh, identify important trends that are un uh, unfolding in, with uh, important monetary and economic variables. The idea is to see if the monetary and economic variables agree with the, essentially are consistent with the, uh, the message of the financial markets. Um, the, the purpose of doing that is, is fairly straightforward. Uh, our research, my research, uh, has uh, learned that um, that the financial markets, uh, on the one hand, and important economic, monetary and economic variables, on the other hand, perform in very specific ways at different stages of the stock market business interest rate cycle, beginning, the middle, and the end. So if by examining trends in the financial markets and examining trends in important economic variables, you can identify where you are in the cycle then making those kind of very important investment decisions such as asset allocation, the percentage of your portfolio that you want to allocate to equities becomes, uh, becomes easier. It doesn't become easy, it becomes easier. So what I'm going to do now in, in the next couple of minutes, and hopefully it doesn't drag on, is to, is to first of all um, share with you what I take to be the important trends in the financial markets and what their message is, and also important uh, uh, economic and monetary variables. You know, after you've done this, you're really not finished. And I, I just throw this out there, because along the way, what happens is we, we, we find that there are what we call manias. Uh, those manias uh, have uh, four distinct stages, and I'm not going to go through them. I've gone through them before. Stage of investment, stage of speculation, stage of financial distress, and the stage appropriately named of revulsion. Uh, those, those, those uh, manias, uh, uh, and I'll get to China in just a second, uh, have those distinct stages, and what they can do is interrupt or change the shape of the underlying cycle. So you really need to know a little bit about manias, what they look like, and whether you're in one or not. But let me go back and just quickly summarize what I take to the, the message of the markets. And I know a lot of you, I'm not going to like me for some of the things I'm going to say, but you have to kind of call it like it is. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the trend in the, in the equity markets, the broad-based equity markets, uh, since May 22nd uh, has been uh, clearly down. Uh, secondly, uh, during that period of time, investors have been migrating to the safer sectors of the market, uh, consumer staples, uh, healthcare, uh, utilities and telecommunications have been at the top of the performance ladder. It's a fairly clear indication that investors uh, are worried about something and have decided to migrate to the safer sectors of the market. 
Uh, thirdly, uh, capitalization, uh, not completely true, but to a great extent, investors have migrated to large capitalization stocks or stocks which are perceived to be less volatile, lower betas, uh, to be technical uh, than, say, small and mid-cap stocks. And in other words, they're still uh, they're migrating to what they take to be the uh, safer parts of the market. In the debt markets, you see it in particular. Uh, not only did interest rates, longer-term interest rates as measured by the yield of the 10-year Treasury, go down, which also, and this gets a little technical, uh, the yield curve, uh, the yield curve uh, uh, narrowed some. Uh, quality spreads, so the difference between the yield on a BAA corporate bond and a 10-year Treasury, the difference between the yield on a junk bond and a 10-year Treasury, those, those, those yields, uh, those spreads opened up again, investors uh, starting to play it safe or getting worried about something. Um, so the message of the markets uh, clearly, well not clearly, quite clearly, somewhat clearly, I think quite clearly, uh, between uh, between the uh, May 22nd and really today, uh, or last Friday when I put the numbers together, is that uh, the current bull market has ended, uh, a bear market has begun, and that bear market would be accompanied by an economic recession. Um, the question then is, is this consistent with uh, important monetary and economic variables? And the answer to that question is clearly no. Um, uh, the ec monetary and economic variables uh, remain very positive. Federal Reserve policy, as we now know, it's, it's, it's the biggest understatement of the year, is, is accommodative. Um, uh, bank lending is, is solid, is strong, whether we talk about commercial industrial lending, whether we talk about real estate lending, whether we talk about consumer loans. Uh, as a result of that, the growth rate of the money supply is very solid. Uh, there's enough liquidity to drive both the uh, financial markets and the economy. And all of this shows up in the index of leading economic indicators, which has uh, which tells us where the economy is going, not so much where it's been, and leading economic indicators. You may have seen the index, which was released this morning, increased 0.1% in, in the month of August. My expectation is they will also, I'm hopeful, increase in the month of September. I don't say that with a lot of confidence. Uh, but nevertheless, it's increased in 22 of the last 24 months. So uh, the message, the essential message of the monetary and economic variables is, uh, is very positive. Uh, positive or telling us that there's further to go in the current, uh, despite the, what the financial markets message is. So the answer to the question, uh, based on what I've said so far, uh, the answer to the question is this a, a correction in an ongoing bull market or is this the end of the bull market and the start of a bear market uh, would be that this is simply a correction, as Kathy has said, quite accurately, I think. Uh, and this will be a, a simply a correction in an ongoing bull market. But I will add, and I will add emphatically, that I don't say that with a lot of confidence. And the reason I don't say that with a lot of confidence is because of the events that are occurring in China. Uh, let me just summarize what China's all about. And, and this is not intended to scare you, but it's intended to just tell you what the heck is going on. Uh, first of all, it is clear, uh, clear as clear can be, uh, that the, the economy of China is clearly slow. Uh, now that, that in and of itself is not, let's say, overwhelming or alarming. It is an important export destination for U.S. companies. 6.8% of our exports, which is a big number, uh, go, to, uh, go to China. The problem is, is that when you have a slowdown in one part of the world, it gets transmitted to other parts of the world. We saw that in 1997-98 when something happened in Thailand, which we thought was small, trivial, insignificant, and it got transmitted around the world and ended up in the uh, Russian default and a lot of other problems. But the point is it gets transmitted around the world. The first way it gets transmitted is simply through the psychology. Uh, the clients that you see uh, in the stock market, especially a significant stock market like the Shanghai Composite, uh, scare investors in other parts of the world, scare investors in Europe, scare investors in the US, and their markets go down. The second transmission mechanism, which is the one that's at play today most obviously, is a decline in commodity prices, a decline in economic activity 
in one country can reduce demand for commodities overall and lead to a price decline. And that price decline can put enormous pressure on, on let's call them commodity dependent countries. Uh, you have six countries of the 14 that are important that we follow. Uh, I hope I get them all. Uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, Canada, Indonesia, Australia, and which one am I missing? Um, at any rate, and I'll, I'll get it for kind of get to it, but this is the look at But at any rate, the point is, is those countries, 30, over 33% of their exports are commodity exports. And not only is that the case, but forecasts for the outcome or their economy based on the declining commodity prices are now negative. Now, uh, particularly when you include Canada and Mexico, these are important export destinations for the U.S. or U.S. companies, especially when you include Mexico and Canada. 29% of U.S. exports go to those six countries. So the, this is not trivial. In other words, the decline in commodity prices that's occurred because of the decline in demand uh, coming out of China, which is clear evidence that the economy of China is slowing. Uh, the, decline, the decline in prices has been transmitted to other countries around the world, and we now see from somewhat clear evidence that those economies are slowing. And again, they're important export destinations for U.S. companies. So the point is, how bad can this get? Uh, the final two, uh, the final uh, two, one I've already implied, uh, the final two transmission mechanisms are trade flows, declining trade flows, and then the final transmission mechanism is uh, the most dangerous of all, is declining commodity fl uh, com capital flows, and that's uh, when you see uh, problems in one country lead to a decline in capital flows from that country to our markets. Keep in mind, keep in mind, based on the, 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 the three quarters numbers, the only ones I have, uh, through the first quarter of um, 2015, over 53% of the uh, flow of capital to the U.S. financial markets uh, has been from, uh, from all foreign countries, has been from China. And that's, that's significant. And, and China is now a net seller of U.S. securities, not a net buyer of U.S. securities. So you can see there are things that are happening uh, that can get transmitted, and that's why I'm saying to you that the message of the financial markets is uh, somewhat dire, uh, and it, it's not confirmed by the uh, monetary and economic numbers, so I'm inclined to still reach the conclusion that this is only a correction in an ongoing bull market and not the conclusion that this is the start of a bear market uh, that will be accompanied by a recession. But I'm not willing to dismiss the idea, the concept, that a recession possibly could occur. And you need to watch the monetary and economic variables very closely every day and reach a, reach a conclusion every day. Uh, there is some good news here. Uh, there's the so-called silver lining behind the dark cloud. Uh, when we started all this, and I, I, I really apologize for talking as long as I'm talking, I apologize, especially you. Um, but uh, the, 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 the the, the silver lining is, and I had said this, and I know it sounds self-serving and braggad braggadocio uh, after saying this. I had said uh, at the beginning of the summer that we hit the wall of overvaluation. The stock market was overvalued. You could not make the case for the stock market moving higher. You just couldn't do it. John Rice is in the crowd. He knows I said that to him. Uh, he was the third hall one day. Um, it, it was an important third hall. I think I won the president. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> But um, the point is that it reached the value of overvaluation. Uh, the decline of 13% moved the stock market down for the first time in a long time uh, to a level which I would characterize as very significantly undervalued, 10% undervalued. Since then, it's moved up. You don't know this, but if you go back and you check, this week I know is a scary week because of what happened today, but it's really only down this week, two tenths of 1% week uh, on this week. Uh, and that's because of a lot of volatility, but it ended up only down two tenths of one percent. But the point being is that we're now moved up some, and we're now 7.7 percent, as I do the numbers, uh, undervalued. Uh, keep in mind, though, that that 2120, 2130 level on the S&P 500 still represents a wall of overvaluation. And based on my forecast for what's going to happen to price earnings ratios and earnings, 
I can't make, I still can't make the case for the market ever moving higher than that, which just means that the upside potential uh, between now and the fourth quarter, this year, fourth quarter 2016 to fourth quarter 2017 is around six to eight percent, not bad, uh, six to eight uh, percent, but hopefully we don't get to that wall of overvaluation too fast. Hopefully, hopefully we get to it slowly, gradually, and with less volatility. Um, I, I think I wanted to say more, but I'm going to stop right there, except to say one other thing uh, that's a deep concern to me. Um, I looked very hard at algorithm trading, trading, and I'm not going to get into the, the, the details of how that works. The level of volatility in the stock market today is largely, not largely, almost completely a function of the lack of regulation of electronic, high, uh, high speed uh, electronic trading, especially algorithmic trading, and a lot of strategies, momentum strategies. Uh, it's, it's, and, and the, 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 just my pet peeve is the fact that the SEC and other regulatory agencies have not done something about this is absolutely ludicrous. Um, they have to do something about it. We used to, we've always had registered trade. We've always had registered traders on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. I used to work down there with registered traders. And we regulated them all the time. Uh, 80 to 85 percent of the transactions that they did had to be counter-cyclical or if the market was going down, they had to be a buyer. If the market was going up, going up, they had to be a sell if they wanted to continue to be registered traders. These guys don't have that kind of a, a limitation. So when the market is going down, they can turn small declines into big declines, and that's why you get the volatility. The real question is, the real question is, is do the markets reflect underlying fundamentals? Is it the case that the market goes down because the output, the prospects for the economy get darker? It does it go up because prospects for the economy and earnings uh, get brighter? Um, I think that's still the case, but believe me, this volatility is blurring our vision. Uh, thank you very much. It's really nice to be here. And uh, I guess what we'll do now uh, is over a couple. Of yeah, and before we do, I'm going to say one thing, which is those of you who know me know that I'm a pessimist, so it's really nice that I get to be the optimist here today. So, um, so I want to say what's fun is that actually I agree with everything you said. I would just put a slightly different coloration on it, which is that I think I think that perhaps a little longer term. And, and, and that's really, I mean, I really mean that because we always tell people you shouldn't have equities at all if you don't have at least a five year time frame. So we, I only think in sort of five year out and more. And that's why I mentioned technology and demographics in the front because I said those are things that are going to be big trends that are going to be part of the way we think for, for many years to come. But I totally agree with what you said about the spillover from China. We've already seen it. You know, uh, Canada has already had negative growth. They're, in a, they're probably in a recession. Same thing in Australia. Um, they have huge booms because of commodities. That's so over, and it's having ramifications. The other thing that we haven't spent a lot of time with, I'm an equities gal, but I've learned for a long time to always pay attention to the bond market. And he alluded to this. The, the, the yield curve has flattened, right? Longer rates are lower relative to short rates than they were a year ago, which tells you the market's worried about slow growth. Um, and I, we agree with that. You know, we think growth is going to be quite modest, and part of it is China slowing down. You've seen the emerging markets that are to, connected to China have had a huge spillover. The emerging markets have been affected by our low interest rates. They've been affected by lots of things that are beyond their control. But there's lots of pockets of things that are that are that are pretty grim. Let, but, let, me, let me just go ahead. Okay. Let me just say something about the yield curve, and that's just what you're keen to talk about right now. But, um, the, for those of you that really care about this kind of stuff, uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, quantifies the probability of a recession starting in 12 months based on the yield curve. They publish it every month. And if you, if you Google Federal Reserve Bank of New York and yield curve, and then go into the yield curve that they publish, you'll see that they show the probability of a recession starting in, in the next 12 months. They currently have that probability at about 3% or 4%. It's, it's a little bit higher than it was, but it's still very low. For example, at the beginning of 2008, it was 40% chance of, of a recession in, in 12 months. So it's really, it's kind of fun with numbers, but it's, it's really use, useful to go take a look at that if you want to track this stuff. 
and, and track it to track it to the listener. So we've given you a lot of stuff, and now the fun part starts where you get to ask questions about anything that we've said or not said. So Gloria. Yeah, I would only add one other thing. One, when we talk about looking long term, one of the fun things that I do is I look at the numbers back to 1871, and um, it's really interesting to see the patterns. And I would say one of the, I won't say it's unusually, this is actually very consistent with what Kathy said. I think we've, we've there are, there have only been four or five cycles during this time, and we've just finished a long-term bull market in the bond market where prices are going up and interest rates are going down. We finished that in July of 2012, and I think we're into a long-term bear market in the bond market that over the next 20 or 30 years, you're going to see interest rates gradually rising. Uh, stock price returns uh, are fine during that period of time. They're not as good as they are during the declining period. Uh, Kathy talked about missing the 80s and the 90s. She talked about the fact that returns might be a little bit less and from the equity markets over the course of, say, the next, she said, I think five years, but let's say, I would say five to 20 years, but still better than the bond market. So I think it's to calibrate your mind and your thinking to lower returns, but returns that will be clearly better than the bond market. It's very important uh, that you recognize you're going to live longer than you think you're going to live, and you maintain a very meaningful uh, percentage of your assets and equities, because that's where the returns are going to be. Uh, be higher. And hopefully along the way you have the help of people that can help you duck or avoid those bear markets. That's not easy to do, but there are ways to do it. The hypothesis <coughs> Thank you. The hypothesis would be that there's very little likelihood, at least in my opinion, on any kind of fiscal policy moving forward in a different way until well into 2017 after the election. And so I was a little surprised yesterday that the Fed didn't at least start raising rates to get some bullets in their gun in case a recession doesn't hit. Could you discuss that? Um, <clears throat> well, um, I'll just say, I, um, my firm has been asking the Fed in our uh, monthly commentaries to raise rates for two years now. Uh, uh, you know, I, I will say we, we are um, probably more optimistic about the U.S. economy, not, a, not in any way effusive, but when you look at the improvements in things like housing, um, you know, the tenor of the job market, there's lots of things that are good. Not robust, but good. And I do believe that the psychology, the effect, the negative effect on psychology of this ridiculous pressure on interest rates from the Fed is very negative for business, for investing, for everything. So um, we were praying that they would raise rates, um, but I, but you, well, you probably got all the press about the fact that there's concerns. Uh, they're, they're, they're talking about concerns about the global economy, wanting to make sure they understand how things are unfolding. Um, but that, ironically, if you read the press three days ago, most people were saying they better not raise rates. So that's my whole point about the short term being so full of noise. Um, the, you know, the Fed is doing things that, um, in my humble opinion, are not exactly the way I would do them, but we understand what they're looking at. And um, remember, what happens with rates is in, in material to the economy is the signaling that it creates because the Fed funds rate you know, used to be 4%, now it's zero, and it's going to gradually go up over the years, but it's going to be gradual. So it's, it's, it's hardly a driver of the economy. And to your point, it's clear monetary policy cannot fix things. You need consistent fiscal policy that people believe in. And neither we nor Europe nor anybody has sensible fiscal policy right now. So that's really a whole different discussion that we're not even getting into. So I don't know if you have any fiscal policy suggestions here for you. Well, um, if, if we take the Congressional Budget Office's numbers, uh, fiscal policy looks like it's in reasonably good shape. And that's if you go out. Yes, I understand the deficits are going to get higher. I understand interest rates are going to get higher. And I understand that's an issue. But as a percentage of GDP, I know mean, you can comment on this, but as a percentage of GDP, uh, the, the deficits going out are not going to be at all ludicrous. They're going to be 2.5 to 3% of the gross domestic product. 
who knows what's going to happen. So if you ask about fiscal policy and you say, we get to that point where we, the cycle is about to end, is there room to start to run bigger deficits by cutting taxes? Imagine this. Cutting taxes and increasing spending. There's a lot of room to do that. Um, and, and my suspicion is it, first of all, will occur for cyclical reasons. And, but secondly, there's a lot of room for a proactive uh, government reduction of taxes and increases. Now, I think, I'm not sure exactly what you're getting at, Joe, but I think you said the Federal Reserve should raise interest rates so they have the room to reduce interest rates should we get into trouble. Is that the idea? I, I, what I'm getting at is that the deficit is, at least in my way of thinking, a major concern in terms of getting that back in line within the next 10, 15 years, Social Security, a lot of those issues. Uh, and, and my only question is I would have thought that the Fed would want some bullets in the gun, recognizing that there doesn't appear to be anything that's going to change well into 2017 on uh, fiscal policy. So I, 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 yeah, I mean, you're fine. talking about using fiscal and monetary policy to, to, to counteract it. <laughs> a big deep recession or a recession or at least a decline in economic activity and uh, the Fed doesn't have any information you're right it's really effectively quantitative easing really didn't do much uh, if anything and obviously they can't reduce interest rates further but actually there's a technical way they could do it but uh, they, they really can't so you it's, it's got to come on the fiscal side of the uh, ledger in other words, it's got to be a reduction in taxes and an increase in, in government spending in order to kind of have any recession. And I think they have, I think there's a lot of work to do. I'd say here, I would disagree, I would disagree on this one. I, I mean, I think if you look at Europe, you, you just know, that, that, that I do not agree with that at all in terms of the way, where we can decrease taxes and increase spending. Um, I think we have to have better balance, but I think that, um, we have to learn from the mistakes of other countries and not think we can have um, spending that is in any way not controlled, given the problems we do have demographically going ahead, right? I mean, we all know that the Social Security and healthcare expenditures down the road are going to be rather massive. So I think these are big issues that, that do weigh on people. We hear it from investors all the time. It's not, and we always say you can't, you know, until the, the checks start to balance, you're not going to see governments doing anything. But these are not insignificant issues. In my yeah, that's, oh, that's all very good. I'd only mention that, and again, I'm not dead sure I'm getting at your issues, but uh, I'm going to sound like Paul Krugman, but um, the, you look at Greece, and um, it's pathetic. Uh, they've been, they've been uh, in a recession for six, now almost seven years. Their unemployment rate has gone from 7.7% uh, to 27.5%. And they've done that because uh, they didn't do what they should have done, and they didn't do today what they should have done. And that is not to increase taxes and reduce spending, but to lower taxes, to increase spending, and to run substantially greater deficits, including debt as a percentage of GDP, and they wouldn't be where they are now. The imposition or superimposing fiscal restraint an economy which is in a recession is going to make it worse, not better. And that's why I'm saying you want those levels if the economy runs into trouble. I know that we're going to run bigger deficits as a percentage of GDP. Debt as a percentage of GDP is not going to be at 74%. It's going to go to 80 or 90%. I understand that, but that's why you have those levers there. You have them there so that you don't stay in a recession for very long. Um, it's, so, I mean, the lever is you want it to be low so that you have to raise that spending, you have the cushion to do it. Whereas the problem with Greece is you're doing it at a time you're already in deep trouble. And that's what, and I agree with you, it's, it was the wrong thing for Greece, but they're a different case because they're already in deep doo And we don't want to get to that point. Joe, does that answer get anywhere near what you have? <laughs> I, I think the fundamental issue is what's long term. I'm thinking more of seven, eight, nine years that there's gonna, we're going to hit a wall in terms of the deficit. I think something like 26 percent of governmental spending now is not entitlement spending, and a lot of those things don't seem to me to be terribly tough fixes if you extend the 
retire age on Social Security to 69, change the CPI index, you buy like another 20 years on that. The, yeah. and, and Washington seems so crippled yeah. that there's only one place to go to at least throw some money against something, and that's the Fed with the rates. That they're so historically low, I just I, I I'm not an economist, but I don't see where they can go anymore. It's like they, there's no no bullets in the gun. The Fed should the should the economy slide into a recession? Right, the Fed can only do so much, and they acknowledge that all the time. Right, they have only one thing they can play with, and they, there's more things on the fiscal side. Could you discuss a bit more uh, the uh, change in uh, China's borrowing uh, or lending to the U.S.? Uh, and uh, is there any indication what level of pullback by the Chinese does that begin to affect the, us and, and the, the, the debt, the, the, our interest payments on the debt? Yeah. Um. I don't know the answer. That's a great question, but I don't know the answer to that question, quite frankly. Um, it, it has always seemed to be the case um, that, um, that if China drops out of financing our deficits or buying our bonds or stocks and bonds, but primarily our bonds, China or any other country, that somebody quickly will come in and fill the gap. And what has to happen in order to fill the gap is there has to be some way to entice uh, another investor or country to do that, which simply is a, uh, an indirect way of saying interest rates go up and become more attractive. So the, the, outcome, the outcome of the loss of capital flows from China could put upward pressure on rates, unless the Federal Reserve steps in and uh, fills the gap, which they have done through quantitative easing. And now they want to back away. And it gets into some technical issues, which are really important. But it's a great question. I really don't know the answer. But my guess is, is that there'll be upward pressure on rates if China continues to back away from our financial rates. Now, one thing I want to add here, what's fascinating to this whole point about the world being so connected, is as you know, interest rates in Europe are extremely low, right? G German bonds are 70 basis points for the 10-year. We're about we're a little over 2 percent. Japan is, you know, very very low rates. So if you're looking at the world as most investors are now, the U.S. yields already look quite attractive. So when you think about U.S. rates rising, as long as Europe is still being very accommodative and Japan's being very accommodative, it's going to keep some downward pressure on U.S. rates. So, so that's why we have to remember there's a lot of signals we're not getting the way we used to because the world is very small and we've got global investors that are affecting interest rates in ways that might not have been the case even 20 years ago and certainly not 50 years ago. So there's a, there's a lot of countervailing factors here. There's, it's been observed that Chinese reserve levels are a bit lower than they were and so people assume that they are indeed you know, selling rather than buying treasuries as you said. But um, whether that's related to what they did to work with their currency, there's lots of different moving parts, so more to come. You know, it's, it's interesting, because that introduces another thing that the Federal Reserve is very concerned about, and they, they pretty much said this, is the dollar. And um, one of the outliers that could really change things, and I mean really improve the outlook for earnings, that's what I'm really talking about, is if we saw stability in the economies of the world, along with the decline in the dollar, if we saw a decline in the dollar, then my forecast for these low single-digit earnings changes through 2017 would start to get better. And that could be the saving grace for the stock market, assuming everything is just nice. <laughs> Incidentally, the other country of the six that I missed was Russia. That was at the top of the list. They had the worst one. Sure. Hugh, going back a few decades uh, to the early 80s where we had stagflation and high interest rates, uh, that was uh, terrorizing for many of us in mid-career. Now that I'm a little older, it's starting to look a little more attractive. <laughs> uh, higher interest rates 
would be beneficial to many, many seniors. Uh, over the past uh, 10 years or so, while we've had a bull market, we've been, we've, uh, we've been happy with the capital appreciation that that has brought. But with uh, the prospects for uh, lower market growth, or perhaps even a recession in, in, the, in the market, uh, seniors just don't have the income. So rising interest rates would sound rather attractive. What are your thoughts on that? It's a great question, Kathy. I'm sure could chime in on this. Uh, it was not only the early 80s, but also the early 90s. The early 90s was very acute. You remember in 1989, the Federal Reserve started to reduce interest rates and reduced it to levels, reduced interest rates, short-term interest rates from nine and three quarters down to three and three quarters, which we thought was a very uh, low level. And, uh, and, and seniors, people, that, uh, a lot of people rely on those high interest rates for their sustenance, for their income. No question about it. And what we saw, what we saw then, was an interesting thing, is that um, this led to uh, a shift uh, by investors away from fixed income securities. They stopped relying on that 6 to 8 to 9 percent and into the equity markets. And uh, they started to think in terms of total return, uh, which they should have thought about all, of that, all along. Uh, and so uh, we've got a different kind of a mindset now uh, that prevailed during the 1990s as well as the year 2000 to 2010 on and off. And that is uh, total return is, is more important. Um, right now, that's the way we're at. And, and, and frankly, if I recognize that if interest rates went up a little bit, Barry, and I understand that they'll become a little bit more attractive and people would buy bonds with a little bit of a higher interest rate, the total return of the bonds, you know, the return of bonds under those conditions that you just described is not going to be very attractive. And in my judgment, based on history, this is really history, um, based on history, the returns available from bonds, even the attractively higher interest rates, are significantly let's just say less than the returns available from the equity markets. And that's why I say, even in a rising interest rate environment, uh, you're much better off to maintain, uh, uh, even though it's attractive levels of interest rates, and those rates in the early 80s were absurd, that's 15%, uh, that's different. Um, but even then, you're better off buying equities, not fixed income. Um, even though rates went from 15 down to four or five. Um, but the full point is, is that uh, maintain a meaningful percentage of your portfolio in equities, and then the total return of your portfolio will be um, enough so that you can withdraw, say, 4%, which is a rule of thumb, from your portfolio and uh, meet your living expenses. I really went through that very fast, and I hope, I'm sure you did, you, you hung in there with that stuff. She's the, she's the financial player. So here's the thing, but we did, none of us talked about inflation, right? So the, those halcyon days were not so halcyon after inflation, right? So you were getting high interest rates, but inflation was, you know, seven, eight, nine percent at the same time. So that's what we have to remember is on a real return basis after inflation, the returns on stocks we're talking about today are lower than they've been, but not that much lower because inflation we do not, I don't think any of us expect it to soar um, in the next few years. Um, and even on the bond side, you know, you'll be get, as interest rates go up, they'll still be going up quite modestly uh, over time. But you're very right about the premise, which is that the, the Fed knows that people who have been living on fixed incomes have been highly disadvantaged by the actions of recent years. There's no question about that. But they have been committed to this low interest rate policy, and it has indeed created problems for those individuals. But the, the, the world is, as we've said, is very different than it's been. We're going to have rising rates for the rest of our lives, um, probably, because rates probably will go up very, very slowly. And so the value of your bond goes down when rates go up. And that's why the total return, as you said, is going to be quite modest. So we would argue, even looking at 10 or 20 years, the return on bonds is going to be 2 or 3% lower than it's been historically for those reasons. If you get a chance, there's another assignment. Um, Robert Schiller of Yale has published numbers back to 1871. One S&P 500 numbers, earnings numbers, 10-year treasuries, and take a look at the pattern of interest rates. And they come down, as Kathy said, very, very slowly, and they go up very, very slowly over 20, 30, 40-year periods, the average being about 30s. 
30 years. We're very, very slowly down, very, very slowly up. There's clearly five cycles. And uh, it's just pretty interesting just to look at that. And you'll see, I think, that it, we're starting this move up. And it's probably going to be a 30-year period, but it's going to be very gradual in rates. And the total return for fixed income will be less than the total return from equities, even though the total return from equities is not going to be as high or as good as it was from 1981 or 82 through 2012 in this last bond market, bull market. Colin? I do. Okay. 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 So, given your long-term view, how do you see the economic environment in the U.S. changing if we have a Democratic administration versus a Republican administration? And I don't want to get into any of the candidates individually, because we don't have that much time. <laughs> well, I always tell people we don't invest to anything. We take, we accept what is, and we invest around it. So I'm not even going to go there. I'm not even going to go there. Um, but I want to add one, one thing, though, which is what remind, I was reminded of this from Barry's comment. Um, the, uh, Hugh referenced history. History is always, we always are educated by history, but it is also true this cycle probably will be longer than most because when you think of what caused it, a financial crisis where interest rates were forced to come down a lot, but people were so scared to use those interest rates to borrow. Usually when, when the economy has a tough spot, the Fed reduces rates, people get excited, they use those low rates to borrow and either buy homes or invest or whatever. That didn't happen this time around because people were delevering, right? They were getting rid of their excess debt. So this is a very different cycle than we've had in probably our lifetime. There have been other cycles sort of like it, but not, not in our lifetime. And therefore, um, you know, we have to accept this one may be longer. Um, and that's why a lot of these things that are frustrating, like low interest rates, may, may, may take longer than we expected as well. Another book, uh, The World in Depression by Charles Kindleberger, 1929 uh, to 39. Get it, read it. Uh, and you'll see what it scares me, another thing it scares me, uh, and what happened in 1937-38. But don't, don't get too worried. It, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't much fun, but it was a significant period in our financial and economic history. And in that period, the Federal Reserve leaned towards restraint, raised interest rates for a variety of stupid reasons, but they did it. And also Roosevelt, the Roosevelt administration got very, very uh, nervous about the size of the deficits that they've been running that were incurred primarily because of public sector spending in order to get us out of the recession or depression. And so he got cold feet and they cut back on government spending and sent us into another recession. And that's what haunts that's people what I'm today, it's, right? It's, that's that's, what that's why I'm saying this, this is, this, political leaders have got to have a sense of history. And if they do, they'll be careful. I think they'll be more careful. And we won't have a repeat of 37, 38. Incidentally, we got out of 38, the recession, not because of the war. We got out because Roosevelt uh, finally uh, woke up and said, this is not working. And he started another plan, a program of uh, government spending. It had nothing to do with the war. And that was part of it, but that helped with the Rosé. Okay. The Fed has been buying uh, quantitative uh, easing, a lot of uh, treasury and so forth. Now, this pile of money sits somewhere. What are the long-term consequences of this change in philosophy, which I guess was the first time they have done that? Boy, is that a good question. Uh, oh, I, I, if I was smart, I'd say I don't have a clue and uh, <laughs> try to duck it. Uh, yeah, it's $4.3 trillion now on their balance sheet. Um, and by the way, it's not just the Fed, it's the central bank in Europe, it's Japan, you name it, right? So this is a global problem that you're so right we've never seen before. And, and the level of, this is, gets into something really technical, and I'll, I'll hit you with it and hope for the best. Um, the, the level of excess, Reserves are in the banking system. Now, that's not money, it's reserves. Uh, reserves are in the banking system to support 
bank lending, and money growth. Uh, there's a significant level of excess reserves in the banking system, three point something trillion dollars. Um, it's not supporting an increase in bank lending. They've got enough reserves. They don't need any more. They don't need these excess reserves. Technically, the Federal Reserve technically uh, could take the securities they bought. When they buy securities from the banking system, they credit the reserve accounts of the banking system. Technically, they could take those securities and sell them back to the banks, and the banks pay for them with reserve credit, the reserve credit that's excess reserves. And that could, have, that could do it like that. Uh, re reverse repos is what it's called. Uh, I'm being told that that won't work, and I'm not sure why it won't work. But I'm being told that that won't work. You, you've raised a great question, because I think one of the real dilemmas that faces the Federal Reserve is the way you get the federal funds rate up from 0 to 25 basis points up from, to, this is very technical, to 25 to 50 basis points, is you put, you put you, you inject reserve pressure on the banking system by lowering the level of reserves in the banking system. Well, you got 3.1 trillion, 3.5 trillion dollars in excess reserves. How are you going to do that? How are you going to put the, how are you going to get the funds rate from 25 to 50? They, they say they can do it with reverse repos. They say I just do. You know, the Fed tells like, us they're experimenting, no, right? They tell us they're experimenting, they're experimenting all the time with this stuff, but to his point, they're, exper they're experimenting only with little bits. So we do have to accept this may have some glitches uh, at some point in time, which is one of the reasons I say everybody has to accept more volatility is going to get back. It's a, real, it's a real challenge. It's a real, I think it's a real challenge. I think it's a challenge. And I, I really do. I think it's a real challenge. It's a great question and a real challenge. That's my take. I'd love to hear what anybody else has. Anybody is more informed. Well, an economist from uh, Citigroup, I don't know, last week or so, he said that there's a 55% chance of a global recession. Um, if that occurs, what would occur, uh, how should one be invested? In the U.S. or somewhere else? I'm going to start one. Like we, you know, we all read these things, and, and, and Citi is very negative on China. So that's I know that's one of their underpinnings, and it kind of goes to the themes that um, he was alluding to before. That you really can get anxious, very anxious about the spillover of this commodities collapse, um, because it does have ramifications for very significant countries like Canada, and Australia, etc., and that can easily flow through. Um, and I think that's really a big part of their of their viewpoint. Um, but I, I I don't I, I I don't think we've talked enough about the U.S. And again, we know the U.S. is not what we'd like it to be. But there's a lot of pretty good numbers starting to show up in the U.S. And we can't discount that. We're still the biggest and most important economy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I'm going to throw in demographics again because the one thing that no one even knows how to forecast is what millennials are going to do. We know they've had pent up demand for housing, and housing markets are still very under uh, underproducing relative to what they were before the recession. Um, we also have the benefit of lower oil prices and all these things. So there's a lot of other things that are positives that we think are, are stabilizing factors. Um, but I do think that the Chinese economists, the, the city group are focusing much more on the Chinese side. But I would go back to what we've all been saying. Um, when we do forecasts for stocks, we do not assume a bullion in markets whatsoever. And even though economies, of course, are connected with stock price movements over time, what matters is what companies do to figure it out along the way. And that's where I would argue you've got a much better chance of sticking with a decent stock allocation than anything else. Now, if we have a terrible recession, rates could go back to zero. But you're still rates are so low, you're not going to make a lot of money on bonds. Um, and um, Inflation's not going to be a problem, so you're not going to seek gold or anything else that supposedly does well in an inflationary environment. So I, you know, we always try to think of all weather investing, and I would argue you still want to have something that's a highly diversified portfolio without thinking you know which things are going to do best. But I do not see us going into a global recession despite all the things we talked about here today. Um, that's an outlier forecast. 
And uh, I all, would always would caution anybody uh, not to uh, buy into the outlier uh, forecast, which is two standard deviations away from the median. The consensus forecast for 2015 is 2.4% growth, and for 2016, 2.7%. We don't have anything. Now, I know their forecast is what it is, but it, it's not consistent with what I'm looking at, particularly index of leading economic indicators. So quite frankly, I would dismiss it. Uh, but if you choose not to dismiss it, which I think is a mistake, um, it, the answer is cash. That's a mistake. <laughs> Just uh, curious if you have any views on less commodity uh, reliant emerging markets. What was that? Uh, you know, as far as the you know attractiveness of investment in, in some emerging markets that are you know, that are less commodity based. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Um, well, I'll tell you, I, I. Um, First of all, let me let me let me say that I, I rely not rely heavily, but yes, I'm on right. people in London. I get some good feedback from them, uh, on commodities, and they, like myself, expect commodities to go back up. They were an emotional extreme, particularly in the price of oil. I've got it coming back up to 60, 65, 70 dollars per barrel. So, but if we assume that the Commodity state and levels have declined further. They're down 19.3 percent. You know, they're down a lot. Uh, I don't have any uh, any emerging markets, uh, but uh, I do a lot of work, not a lot of work, some work on uh, on various countries around the world. And the only four countries that get all of my tripwires positively, which is leading indicators, consensus forecasts for the economy is going up. And stock prices are posting relative performance better than the U.S. That's what I'm taught, the combination I'm looking for. And I get that for Europe. I get that for um, India. I get that for Germany. And I get that for France. And no other things. So, and India is certainly the one that most people have looked to because of its lack of commodity dependence and the potential for reform, of course. <coughs> Any other questions? Just, just also curious. So, what, to what extent, you know, there's a lot of geopolit geopolitical instability around the world. Uh, to what extent, it's a little difficult to factor that into investment, you know, approach and all. I don't know to what extent you guys get worried about that or try to accommodate the things going on in the world. I, I, I. I I do a lot of number crunching and a lot of forecasting, and uh, I can't get that stuff. Let's be exaggerating. I can't get that into my models. It yeah, changes so often. I just can't yeah. get it in there. There's always something, and I think going back to what you said about the long run, if you look at the long run, it's actually encouraging. It's just that we've had some horrible, horrible wars, and people have always had to figure out a way to rebuild and feed their children, right? And that's why, it, it, you know, it, 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 you hate to talk about it, but, you know, things get back. And there was a, a, an article about Germany the other day that, um, you know, Germany, like many European countries, is already in, uh, you know, declining population mode. And there's actually towns, you know, desperate for the Syrians to come in and excited about getting new workers. So there's just, there's different trends that occur that, occur that have countervailing forces, and that's always the case. Um, but you're right, it, it definitely affects psychology, but it certainly doesn't affect the economy or the markets very much. Because like, to some extent, that could actually make the U.S. a more attractive place, mm -hmm. because, you know, we might be a bit more immune to some of those difficulties or yeah. the impact. Right. Versus other markets. Right. If there aren't any more questions, then I'd like to thank Hugh and Kathleen.